Hello, I'm Jonathan Wolf. I'm co-founder and CEO of Zoe uh, and Tim's partner. Now, as you know, Tim is away today. He's off for two weeks having a wonderful vacation. I can't compete with the tan, but I thought I'd do my best job. So here's me as Tim. So in this week's update, I wanted to cover a few things. Firstly, the latest numbers. Secondly, how our rates compare to other countries. And then I'd like to take this opportunity to explain a little bit about the people who are behind the Zoe COVID study uh, and basically make this video and the data you see possible every week. Next, I'd like to talk with some more information on the so-called pandemic and the effectiveness of the NHS and Scottish COVID tracking apps. So let's talk about today's cases. So the Zoe COVID study estimates that there are 46,000 new cases of COVID every day. And if you look at the graph, what you can see is we've really seen a flattening out. So last week, Claire was saying, look, we're really starting to see this big decline of this third wave. When you look at it this week, we still have an R of 0.9. So that suggests that there is a slight decline week on week that's continuing, but it's now very small. And I think it's much harder to predict really where that's going um, next week. And if you look at the breakdown between cases, what you see is there continues to be a significant number of cases in people who are fully vaccinated. That's around 11,000 and around 28,000 in people who are completely unvaccinated. So continuing to see many more cases in people who are unvaccinated, but the significant number of people who are vaccinated. And of course, that means that the virus is spreading at a much lower level within that large group of people who are fully, fully vaccinated. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, the first thing is, for those of you who haven't been fully vaccinated, please do go ahead and, and do that. It's making this very big difference, not just in your chances of getting COVID, but I think really importantly in your chance of being hospitalized. And our own data continues to show that for people who are fully vaccinated, even though we are seeing you know, quite a few of these cases of what's called breakthrough vaccination, you know, very, very few people are going on to, uh, to be hospitalized, completely different from the picture that we saw you know, earlier in the pandemic or today still in people who aren't vaccinated, where those levels of hospitalization are as high as ever. The other thing I think to be aware of is we're not really seeing any impact of Freedom Day. There was a lot of talk about this uh, and a belief that we might see a big increase in cases. Actually, we're not seeing that. However, the total number of cases per day is still very large. And you know, to put that in context, the number of people who are getting symptomatic COVID every day is equivalent of filling 50 secondary schools every day. Uh, and actually you would fill every single secondary school in Scotland in a week with these current levels. So that means continue to be sensible, continue to be aware that the level of COVID out there in the community is, is very high. One thing to be aware of is that there is less testing in general going on. That's not true for people reporting through our, our app because we're asking everyone who has these symptoms to do so, but elsewhere with people no longer, with children no longer going to school, and if like me, you know, you have kids who are at the age going to school, you know they were doing these frequent lateral flow tests. This was picking up a lot of asymptomatic cases. This is not going on at the moment, so you would sort of expect less testing, and therefore there will be people who are not uh, identified, uh, who will be identified again as we go back into school, which will start in Scotland actually this month, uh, and England and Wales next month. Finally, I think everybody's very interested in what's the long-term impact of these vaccines. In other words, how long will they continue to work? Will we see that they become less effective? And will we need boosters in the autumn as some countries are already starting to talk about? So the good news is we're actually organizing a webinar which will start in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's a link also here uh, for you to sign up and we'll be able to take actually the data from Zoe to start to understand the effectiveness of vaccines over time that we're seeing because some people have already had their vaccines now for, for many months and we will continue to track that with your help and further information from you. Now let's turn to the international data and how does the UK compare with other countries around the world? Well the first thing you see is the UK continues still to have very high levels but the good news is that's been coming down. The less good news is that actually there are a number of countries that have been uh, climbing and starting to be at the same sort of levels as the UK. Um, so we're no longer you know, the only country with these really high levels on the back of Delta. We do continue to be among the highest country in the world. So Spain, still high, but there does seem to be some decline. Elsewhere, we're really starting to see the impact of the Delta variant and see these real growth. So I think if you look at Israel, it's very interesting. They used to actually have the lowest levels across all the countries we were looking at, uh, and now they actually have shot up to have the highest. 
And I think what's interesting about Israel is like the UK, they have very high levels of vaccination. And so what that means is a lot of these um, infections that we're seeing are actually people who have had the vaccine and are having this breakthrough cases of COVID. Uh, and in Israel, they are actively looking at giving booster shots to those aged over 60 as a response to this. Elsewhere in France and the USA, we're continuing to see real growth. And in the US in particular, we're seeing this combination where not only is Delta uh, starting to really become a big part of the cases, and so that's driving this increased infectiousness, but there's still a lot of people who are not vaccinated in the US. So alongside this rise in cases, they're also seeing a, a rise in hospitalizations uh, amongst those people who have not been vaccinated. Since I'm in the chair today, I thought I would tell you a little bit more about the team at Zoe that supports the Zoe COVID study and everything that you see from Tim every week. Prior to the pandemic hitting, uh, I was actually working with Tim and with my co-founder George, running the largest in-depth nutritional study in the world. And what we were trying to understand was the link between our gut microbiome, so the microbes inside our gut, and how that leads to each of us having different responses to food. And as a result of carrying out this study, we were working on being able to deliver a test kit and a solution that would allow you to understand what you should eat that would lead to improved health and uh, loss in weight. Then the pandemic hit and really overnight we switched the whole company to figuring out how we could do something that was useful. And in five crazy days, uh, particularly with the engineering team, we launched the Zoe COVID study. Now, obviously the most important people of all are you. The more than 4 million participants who are providing the data every day that allows us to understand what's going on uh, with COVID, um, you know, with this incredible granular detail. But it also requires, you know, all of these different teams and I'd like them to, to say hi and introduce them to you too quickly. So maybe I'd like to start with engineering and product and design. So they're actually responsible for designing how the app works, building it and making sure that it runs. They're the people who incredibly rapidly go from a new idea we have about something we'd like to study, whether it's the pandemic uh, or nutrition or anything else, to actually delivering it. And they're also the people who make sure that when a million of you check your data in an hour, everything works and the app doesn't fail. That's the first group. Um, the second group is the data science team. And the data science team are the people who take all of this data and turn it into the results. So everything that you see in the app, uh, all the daily results you see also on this video are created by the Zoe data science team. Uh, their background is sort of data science, machine learning, and I think for them it's been incredibly exciting to learn how they can use these tools and apply it to, to this pandemic. And then they also work very closely with our partners at King's College London in terms of doing the research and the academic papers which are really understanding you know, how COVID is developing. Then we've got the customer su uh, support team. So they answer all your emails and queries, as you can see, it's a very small team. So, you know, if sometimes it takes us a while to get back to you, please be understanding they work incredibly hard to try and support this community uh, who's making all of this happen. And then finally, we've got the content and communications team. And so this is the team that produces these videos, that produces all the blog, all the other content, which allows us to share back with you everything that we're learning. And I think the central thing that, that Tim and I believe is that this only exists because of your information and ultimately we're working for you and we want you to have you know, the real information as fast as we possibly can do it with the best possible accuracy. I'd like to thank the whole Zoe team. You're amazing. You've worked incredibly hard now for more than 18 months. Uh, I know I have to work so hard to convince any of you to take any vacation. Uh, I'm really, really proud of everything that you've done uh, and I know that Tim feels the same way. Thank you. Another amazing piece of research made possible by this team is the pandemic analysis that we've been able to do over the last few weeks. And just to remind you, this is where we try to understand how well these two apps, this is the NHS COVID-19 app uh, and also the Protect Scotland tracing apps work, where they ping you if you've been in close contact with someone who uh, has had COVID. And I think the question was, how well do these apps work in, in terms of actually identifying people with COVID? Claire showed you some really interesting data last week, but we've been able to do some further analysis and so I thought I wanted to take the opportunity today to, to take you through that. Now, please be aware, all of this data is based upon the raw data from you, the people who are participating in the Zoe COVID study, and we haven't adjusted this for the wider population. On the other hand, we are talking about a very large number of people, uh, and this is the only study we're aware of so far in the world to really uh, start to understand how these apps work. While our results show that if you've been pinged, it does increase your chances of having COVID, 
it also showed that in many cases, your absolute chance of having COVID is still quite small. And that's especially true if you've been double vaccinated. Now we have some more data. I'd like to sort of break that out a bit and explain what that really means. We put all of this together in this table so that you can see the, the data clearly. So firstly, let's look at what the probability of testing positive is uh, for COVID for our ZOE participants, depending upon vaccination status. And what we've seen, which is really interesting, is that if you're unvaccinated, actually you have about a one in three chance of having COVID. So that's a very high chance of having COVID. However, if you're double vaccinated, then actually your chance if you're pinged is about one in 11. So that actually means 10 in 11 people who've been vaccinated did not have COVID. And so that is not a very accurate measure uh, of whether or not somebody has, uh, has COVID, um, uh, particularly when historically being pinged implied that you needed to um, isolate for a significant period of time. What we've done now, however, is to take all the data that you are participants have given us around symptoms and overlay that with the information from uh, whether or not you've been pinged. And here we see something really interesting. If you've been pinged and you have any of the COVID symptoms that Zoe identified, then actually, if you're unvaccinated, you have a one in two chance of having COVID. And if you're double vaccinated, you have a one in three and a half chance. So in other words, if you also have symptoms at the point that, you have, that you're that you pinged, there's actually a very high chance that you have um, COVID. And that's true even if you're double vaccinated. And so I think our takeaway from this is, you know, if you're getting pinged and you have symptoms, then you should absolutely do a test. And if you're a participant uh, in Zoe, then of course, if you have any of the 20 symptoms, then we'll actually invite you for free to go and do uh, a COVID test. If on the other hand, you're double vaccinated and you're pinged, then actually your likelihood of having COVID is quite low. And we think that you know the changes in the rules, which are just coming on the 16th of August, suggesting you don't uh, need to be isolated, make a lot of sense. Now, again, remember, the set of symptoms we're talking about here are not the classic ones that the government has talked about, but the full set of 20 symptoms that we see associated with COVID. And the other thing that I'd like to take you through is that actually these symptoms are different if you've been double vaccinated than if you haven't been vaccinated. So now let me talk to you about what the symptoms of COVID are today. And this is taken from your data reported in the Zoe COVID study over the last 30 days. And these are just the top five symptoms we actually see more than 20 symptoms. So for those of you who have been double vaccinated, the first is runny nose, the second is headache, the third is sneezing, the fourth is sore throat, and the fifth is loss of smell. For those of you who are unvaccinated, actually the list now looks quite similar with Delta, so in a slightly different order. The first is headache, the second is runny nose, the third is sneezing, the fourth is sore throat, and the fifth is loss of smell. So in both cases, what you see is that the most common symptoms are really quite different from the traditional symptoms that we've associated uh, with COVID, uh, with only loss of smell still there in the top five. To conclude, I'm glad to say that COVID cases uh, remain well below the peak that we've seen, but they are roughly flat week on week. And so what does that mean? That means cases continue to remain high. Uh, and so I think we all need to continue to act responsibly, be aware that there's a lot of COVID around. And of course, if you haven't had both shots of your vaccination, do go ahead and do that. Otherwise, do please spread the symptoms. Do remember there are 20 different symptoms of COVID. And today with Delta, actually it's quite easy to confuse symptoms that could be of COVID um, with some cold-like feelings. So remember, if you do have any of those, do go ahead and get tested. Thank you so much for continuing to log your symptoms. Your contributions are invaluable and they're crucial in helping us to continue our research around COVID. Do please keep an eye on the website uh, in order to uh, learn about the latest news that's going on. And please remember to like and subscribe to this video. And the good news is you don't have to have me again next week. It's back to Tim with an even better tan. Thank you so much and carry on logging.